found it much more difficult after I had children of my own. And I, I used to borrow, when I was settling down to write the book, I used to borrow friends' children, generally one at a time, to come and stay with me for a week. <laughs> and if a child is completely alone with you, and you're the only person they've got to talk to, they do talk to you. What about you? Has having children of your own changed your view of children? It's blurred it. <laughs> and grandchildren? Oh, yes. Well, uh, of course, they're more... Um, you haven't the same responsibility for them. In High Wind in Jamaica, the treatment of the children is very original. Were you conscious of writing about children in a new way? Well, no. It, it, when I wrote it, it never occurred to me that anybody could see children in a different way. But when it, uh, and when it came out and there was a great hoo-ha about our children really like this, I was flabbergasted. There was a um, head headmistress of the Royal School for Officers' Daughters at Bath wrote to the press saying that she was certain that none of her little girls would commit a murder, but that if they had she was equally certain they would own up. <laughs> I was astonished when the book uh, seemed to be regarded as a revolutionary view of children. I th thought it was just uh, what everybody must think about them. When it came out in Europe, it just seemed to go like a bomb. I came back from America plumb in the middle of it. Find myself a, a public character. And you were 29 at that time? Yes. And did it affect your life? Well, like anything. I mean, I very much disliked being a public character. And... Uh, it had all come, I thought, too early and too easily. <clears throat> and I f fled from it to Morocco, where I bought a little house up in the Casbah in Tangier, the, it was said to be the first Christian since the 17th century to live in the Casbah. In Hazard came out in 1938, just about Munich time. And then, during the Battle of Britain period, I was, felt most strongly that if I didn't make the war, the, really the main theme of whatever I was trying to write, it would be a shocking waste to have been a writer and lived through that and ignored it. But I had to let it recede to get into perspective, so I didn't begin writing it until 1955. By that time, we'd moved up here. This is, you know, top right-hand corner of Cardigan Bay, with Snowden as a backdrop. The title which came to me was The Human Predicament. And uh, I started to write it thinking it was going to come into a, one volume. But um, by the time I'd written 110 pages, I found I'd covered three weeks. Having begun it, uh, begun it with the Munich Hitler Putsch in 1923, because I felt I'd got to show the beginnings of Nazism. Nazism was something which had happened, but was so incredible that a writer had got to make it credible. Historians couldn't. Clearly, it had got to be published in 
several volumes. And the several volumes would need separate titles. So the first one was called The Fox in the Attic. Only the steady creaking of a flight of swans disturbed the silence, laboring low overhead with outstretched necks towards the sea. It was a warm, wet, windless afternoon with a soft feathery feeling in the air. Rain, yet so fine it could scarcely fall, but rather floated. It clung to everything it touched. The rushes in the deep choked ditches of the sea marsh were bowed down with it. The small black cattle looked cobwebbed with it. Their horns were jewelled with it. Curiously stumpy too, these cattle looked. The whole herd sunk nearly to the knees in a soft patch. And here, in a sodden tangle of brambles, the scent of a fox hung, too heavy today to rise or dissipate. The gate clicked sharply and shed its cascade as two men passed through. Both were heavily loaded in oilskins. The elder and more tattered one carried two shotguns, negligently, and a brace of golden plover were tied to the bit of old rope he wore knotted round his middle. The younger man was springy and tall and well built and carried over his shoulder the body of a dead child. Well, that came, I was um, sitting in the garden of a pub in Spain to start the book. And general noise and racket all round me and blazing hot sun. And so I started to describe a scene which was climatically absolutely the opposite. I mean, it was quite quiet and it was well sea marsh. And then, I, yes, in that case, I did see, I saw two men approaching and I hadn't the least idea who they were. And then when they got near, I saw to my own horror that one of them was carrying a dead child. Among the fictional characters, as opposed to the factual ones in the book, the central one, Augustine, was born like you in 1900, and like you, he's found living in Wales. How deep does the coincidence between Augustine and you go, do you think? Well, he's not an autobiographical character. I made him my own age because I wanted him to go through some of the same experiences. I mean, to have been at Oxford at that particular time, which was unlike any other time, the time just after the First War. And um, I did it for convenience in that way. But um, he's otherwise, I mean, after all, I've never been a rich landowner. And um, no, he's, I don't think he's, his character is based on mine at all. Are you conscious of sources in other people for characters that you invent? Hardly at all. There's a, the only one uh, that was taken. I practically never draw them from life. The only one that I did in the Fox and the Attic was the old coroner. Dr. Dr. Brindley. Dr. Brindley, yes. It's and I really... I took for granted, you see, he was a man I'd known about 30 years before, and he was very ancient then and very drunk. And I took for granted that he was quite safely dead, until the fox in the attic was in proof. And I happened to ask somebody who knew the district about him and said, oh, he's going strong. And that scared me out of my life, because I simply couldn't publish it, and yet it was already 
uh, well, it was beyond proof. I'd returned the proofs to being run.